me Angelo, Jello, you had me Angelo. You had me Angelo, oh, you had me Angelo. Hey everybody, it's five o'clock on a Friday again which means another time for another episode of Cello Chat. Very excited to have with me this week, Alicia Randizi Hooker. Alicia, how are things? Things are good, Benjamin. They're really good. <laughs> good. Well, Happy New Year to you, and I'm glad you could join me. And to you as well. All right. Would you, would you tell uh, your background all the way from what drew you to cello in the first place and, and how you got to where you are today? Well, it's, you know, like so many people of my generation, um, I began in a public school string program and I was in the fourth grade. Um, I wanted to play the French horn. <laughs> I thought it sounded so noble and wonderful and uh, such a beautiful sound. And um, I took an exam in, I guess, at the end of third grade, they did a music aptitude exam, and I had already been studying piano, grew up in a musical household. My mother was a singer. My grandmother was a piano teacher. My father was an amateur trumpet player who um, says that his favorite instrument was the stereo. <laughs> um, and so I grew up surrounded by music as a young child and apparently I sang before I talked mm -hmm. but um so it was kind of in the DNA but uh I went to a public elementary school on Long Island in New York which is where I grew up and I took this exam and it said I had a very high musical aptitude and so they said you should play a string instrument because you have a good ear <laughs> so we had a violin in the house. My grandfather had been an amateur violinist, but I wanted no part of the violin. Um, it just didn't appeal to me. Hmm. And my father brought home a recording of Casals. It was a, a little anthology of short pieces. And he said, you should play the cello. So I listened to this recording and that was it. I was transfixed. I went to the school. They had run out of French horns anyway. <laughs> uh, the funny joke is that I later married a horn player. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got to have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, it, it, it just, in in that school program, my very first teacher was, Rihanna Ricci, and she was the daughter of Ruggiero Ricci. So lucky me. Mm -hmm. But she was a violinist, of course. And I didn't get a private cello teacher until I was almost 13. So I started at 10, about, I guess, just about fourth grade, what, what, however old you are, I guess about 10. And um, I didn't have my first private lesson for a couple more years. So it was a struggle. They didn't have fractionalized cellos back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was dragging a cello that was as big as I was <laughs> back and forth to school. <laughs> and I don't know, I was a determined little kid, I guess. I was teased all the time. I get on the bus and they'd say, cello, Alicia. <laughs> but, you know, I was determined. And, um, uh, I was for years behind my some of my peers who had started privately and growing up in New York um, with some of my friends going to Juilliard prep and things like that. I, I felt like I had a pretty massive inferiority complex for a really long time. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the determination to continue and to learn drove me and carried me over the rough spots. So um, that's how I got started. And um, I had a teacher in high school who was, she just made me love music. She wasn't real big on technique. Um, I sort of 
learn thumb position by being told, oh, here, you're 16, you need to know thumb position, here's the Baccarini Concerto. <laughs> which was kind of a rough way to learn thumb position, you know? <laughs> but again, you know, I had to fight really hard to figure out the lay of the land on this instrument. And yes, I had a lot of teachers. Um, I won a full scholarship. I uh, auditioned for a few schools. I auditioned for Indiana University. Um, I got in by the skin of my teeth. I don't know how, but I would have had to study with a graduate student. I got a scholarship at Ithaca College, but then I got a full scholarship to the University of Tennessee. And that's where I live now, but I have not, obviously, I have not lived here continuously. My, I did meet my husband here, though. And um, I had a teacher who was tough as nails, woman teacher named Mary Fraley. And um, she, was, she made a cellist out of me somehow. Um, she was very hard on me, which I think I needed, but it, it was not psychologically the best fit for me. But um, from there, I moved later. I, I, I actually had along with the full scholarship, which my parents said, well, you have to take, you know, I mean, you're going 800 miles away, but a full ride will ride. So I, and they also offered me a position in the Knoxville Symphony, which at the time was a metropolitan orchestra. It's since now, now is a regional and a very fine group. Um, but I, it gave me some professional experience at a very young age uh, and far, far before I was ready for it. But, you know, you learn on the job. Sometimes you just get thrown into situations and you have to sink or swim, right? So um, sometimes I sank. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it, it, all in all, it was a really important foundation. So from there, uh, the summer I graduated, I went off to... Um, a program that no, uh, sadly no longer exists called the Congress of Strings. Um, and the teacher there was ha a young Hans Jensen, who uh, certainly opened my eyes. <laughs> uh, and he was very good for me. Um, and I really learned a lot that summer. And from there, I, I was in my early 20s, I think I was 22 at the time. And so um, I started, the, the man that I married was a horn player in Chicago, and um, he grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, like we now live, but at the time he was getting his master's at Northwestern. And I thought we sort of got together during that summer after I graduated, and I decided to move to Chicago. What could be bad about that? So up I went and studied for a time with Frank Miller and Leonard Chauso, who was the assistant principal cellist of the Chicago Symphony, auditioned for Civic and got in a miracle. <laughs> Again, um, I always felt technically, um, like I felt that I had a lot to say musically, but I was very far behind in technique. So um, studied there for uh, several months. I mean, it wasn't a long time. It was less than a year when um, Dale Clevenger said to my husband, they're holding auditions in Shreveport, Louisiana. They're looking for a principal horn and associate principal cellist. You guys should audition. So we made our tapes back then on Reel to Reel um sent them off to the conductor and he hired us sight unseen on a taped audition and off we went we were a month before we were to be married and um and there and I was astonished to find myself in a professional setting <laughs> it turned out to be a great gift so um from there we started you know 
because it was, again, a smaller metropolitan orchestra with a core of full-time players, and then the rest of the orchestra was per service. You know, we started taking auditions, looking for the great job in this. And it was during that time, and also in Chicago, where I met some teachers and freelancers who were like, oh, you'd be a really good Suzuki teacher. I'm like, what? I had also been exposed to it at the University of Tennessee. My teacher had been adamantly against it, but William Starr, who is a bit of a legend in a founding father of the Suzuki method in the United States, had also said, you should come, come and observe, come and observe. I think you'd be a very good Suzuki teacher. And I was very good friends with um, one of his young protégés, Hiroko Driver, who is a teacher trainer now, a longtime teacher trainer from Japan, had studied with Dr. Suzuki. So I'm backtracking a little because I've left out that part. And uh, so at any rate, this has always followed me from the time I was in college, then to Chicago, where people suggested, oh, you know, you should get in on this because it's a new thing and we need cellists. And I, I just wanted no part of it. I had been kind of brainwashed against it by my own teacher in college. But then when I got my job in Louisiana, um, there was a program, a small college, Centenary College. And they said, oh, you should come and teach in our program, but you've got to get some Suzuki training. And again, I said, no, this was the third time um, and at that time I was, you know, just focused on getting a better orchestra job and being a better cellist. And so I began taking lessons in Dallas, which was a three hour commute, um, with Lev Aronson, who really then is, as he's well known as a great pedagogue and he was well known for having taught Ralph Kirschbaum, Lynn Harrell, um, and John Sharp, who was principal cellist, won the principal cellist job in Chicago while I was studying with um, Mr. Aronson. So uh, I got very serious about possibly doing a master's at SMU. And I had studied with Mr. Aronson for about 18 months at that point when my husband won a position in a brass quintet based in Philadelphia. So then we had big decisions to make. And um, Mr. Aronson said to me, you know, you can, you can study anywhere Philly, and you can go to Baltimore and study with Stephen Cates. He understands my principles, and um, you've already learned a lot, so you should go. And even though I had an assistantship to SMU, it was very hard to give it up, but I decided finally that moving and keeping my marriage intact was a good thing. <laughs> um, so off we went. And I think I, I, you know, you asked, you mentioned earlier, like the teachers that influenced me the most. And I would say Lev was definitely the biggest influence on my playing, my concept of sound, my, my technique, finally. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but then when I got to Philly, I worked for several years. I did some teaching. Um, worked as the head librarian of the Settlement Music School and took lessons with members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, chief among them Lloyd Smith, who was the assistant principal cellist at the time. Lovely man, very, very helpful in terms of me learning the orchestral repertoire. And I made a lot of friends, and a lot of my friends were Curtis grads. Mm. And I just would go to gigs and sit next um, and and just sort of absorb, um, try to be a sponge as mm -hmm. much as possible. 
And then I decided I did want my master's after all. So I applied to Temple University. And um, I won't go into a lot of detail about that because it was it was a tough experience. Um, they were in the midst of a transition. They were joining for a new school. Um, the faculty, cello faculty was a bit politicized at the time because of the association with the Curtis faculty. Um, and I had been sort of warned off of a particular teacher who shall remain nameless, who was very famous by Mr. Aronson. So I studied with the second in command. And, and this did not endear me to the more famous teacher, let us say. So it, well, I got caught in a, a bit of a political crossfire, but my chief champion and advocate was a, the conductor of the orchestra, Luis Diava, who um, many people know as a great gentleman. And he stood up for me when no one else would. So I got through my master's, I didn't have to pay it. And during that time, I was, um, I was, my assistantship was for teaching in the community, um, the community music school at Temple and also at the Center for Gifted Young Musicians. Mm. And they said, we need a Suzuki teacher. And then finally, I just threw up my hands and said, okay, <laughs> I will do it. So I went off to Ithaca, um, Ithaca College for my summer institute training. And my teacher training was a remarkable genius woman named Annette Costanzi. And also the very, very, very well-known and respected Carrie Beth Hockett. These two became my mentors. And uh, it was really there that I, I had a fire lit under me, under me. And I met some of the most influential Suzuki teachers in the country at the time. Rick Mooney, who of course has given us position pieces and thumbs of steel and all the rest of it. And, um, and Gilda Barston, who I just missed uh, by a few months of, if, if I had stayed in Chicago, I probably would have done my teacher training with her. Mm -hmm. um, I later did do some training with her. So that began the Suzuki journey, which was a 10 year operation because I had to do it mostly in the summers. Mm -hmm. And um, that added to my, um, my arsenal of skills and also my commitment to it. I sort of fell in love with it. At, that summer was a pivotal summer for me because all the things that I had been striving for, the underpinning of a technique that functions, really, really started to click with that. Because everything that I had been trying to do suddenly made sense because I saw these little tiny people doing amazing things with with no tension and with <laughs> an ease and an or you know one of the things that um Hans Jensen said to me was like yeah 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 you need to be more organic ah and he said you the trouble with you is you worry too much and you know, you know, I'll never forget this. I mean, sitting in a lesson, trying to play Dvorak for him, and and then you know I'm sitting in a Suzuki Book One training class and thinking, that's it, hmm. that's it, organic and stop worrying, and and there it was when when a five year old child played French folk song and I sat there and cried. <laughs> because the sound was so beautiful on this little teeny quarter size cello. <laughs> and I thought, I have to learn how to do this. So that was, that was a, a time that informed the, the next phase of my career and certainly kept me, um, kept me interested in, in just keeping going and, going through all the training and the, all of the units. And, you know, at, at many times also I was urged to become a teacher trainer, but 
my husband did change careers um, after coming in second in places like Detroit and Boston and and then being in the brass quintet, which was under management, but which financially looked like, you know, a, a sine wave. <laughs> um, he decided to pursue uh, medicine. So a 10 year odyssey of medical school and two children born in the midst of medical school one after the between the physiology final and the um anatomy final his okay. first year the second one during his first week of residency <laughs> so i was supporting the family i had 36 students and um there was just no time to do all the videotaping without sacrificing my kids so that's kind of the 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 reason why I have sort of had to um, patch a career together that is a little less of a straight line. Yeah, it, it's been not not a, a straightforward trajectory, but it's certainly a satisfying one. Well, I have to admit, I really like what I think this is. I think this is episode one hundred and sixteen, mm. and the number of times that that various guests have not had a straight kind of <laughs> monolithic trajectory to their careers, I think is, is good for my students to hear, hopefully other youngsters watching this. And another thing too, that, that crops up a surprising number of times is the number of times that people got a late start or even if they felt that they were behind in some aspect uh, but they just they had determination and mm -hmm. you know <laughs> that grit kept putting in the necessary work to get there that also is just hugely inspiring for young people to hear but i do one of the qu questions before i want to ask about uh, yeah, motivation sure. and other things. yeah <laughs> but how with a with a career that had uh, orchestral playing as such a a staple and yet uh when i when i look through your website for example the thing that you highlight is your passion for chamber music how did that come about yeah oh well you, you know i always enjoyed as a as a high school student and as a college student my favorite thing was playing in um my string quartets. And in high school, I had a trio with a brother and sister, um, who one of whom is now a violist in the National Symphony and a Curtis grad. And the other is now a physician, but he's kept up his playing and played doctor's symphony here and there and very active in New York. Um, so that was my lucky little trio as a high school student. They taught me how to count. <laughs> And how to use a metronome. Um, <laughs> and then in college, I had a really good quartet. And Hiroko was the first violinist in that quartet. So lucky me getting to play with a graduate student as a freshman, you know. Mm. Um, again, I always felt like I was out of my depth, hanging on by a thread, but somehow managed to learn the part and play the music. And then um, when I moved to Philadelphia and I was in grad school, um, I had an opportunity through a friend of my dad's who ran a music festival in Germany to go and study with the Alban Berg Quartet. And better believe I grabbed it. And I will never forget the first time I heard them play. They did a concert at Carnegie Hall with Philippe Entremont and they were, you know, that was like the winter before I, they just happened to be there. And we went to hear them because um, I had, you know, been told that they were gonna be teaching at this festival. So I applied and I got accepted and I, I went for eight weeks to study with them, and I went two summers in a row. And it was the 
our quartet, I had a, a string quartet and then a piano quartet, and then I did the Brahms F minor piano quintet the second year. And it was something about the piano, you know, but which I had started on as a kid and just sort of struggled with. My brain wiring is a little different. Um, but I always loved the piano. And so when I had the opportunity to play here in Knoxville, after I, uh, when we moved to Knoxville, long story short, or skipping a few years of you know medical school and post residency, um, I played in a piano trio for a short while when we lived for about three years in Texas, right after my husband finished his residency, um, and then moved to Knoxville. And I played um, some chamber music with a pianist at a small college here, He's a very fine pianist, and um, we had sort of dug out we tried to convince several violinists to come and join us. And we did uh, the Borjak piano quintet. And that was ugh, 2014, I think. And so that rekindled this passion for chamber music. So we've had for the last nine years, a piano trio called Trillium. And um, my passion for chamber music has never left me. And it's also been a way to by playing up because once my children hit middle school here I had to sort of and we had illnesses in the family parents getting sick cancer um my dad passed away my mother-in-law was very ill also and so it was just impossible with middle school age children to be and my husband at this point a doctor taking call at the hospital but all, and his schedule being so unpredictable, evening rehearsals became really, really, really difficult. So I stepped away from the symphony and focused my energy then on the piano trio. And we're at the college where I'm an adjunct. The professor, piano professor was this pianist, Robert Bonham. And um, so we formed a piano trio and we've been going yes. ever since. <laughs> that's cool but yeah and i love the repertoire it's Excellent. just it really because, is because it's demanding repertoire you know yeah and the composers are being so efficient when they only have three or four people to write for yes an entire symphony <laughs> right except the piano gets to be an orchestra right <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> so his job is a lot bigger than than mine or the violinist but you know, still, we make it work. Yeah, excellent. Well, so let's see. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited that this coming March, I kind of, I want to put in the word, finally, the Suzuki Society and the American String Teachers Association yes, are, are having their conferences together. Yes. Yeah. That's going to be, I think that's going to be really great. Just so yeah. many opportunities um, for sharing ideas and such. But I'm just thinking with your with your Suzuki training and uh, the fact that you, like like others, have taught people age three to 80. You know, yes. I mean, <laughs> some, sometimes our pedagogical teaching will will make generalizations about here's how you teach this or here's how you teach that. But things change when you teach the very young and in sometimes yes. the very old, especially if, if they're just starting. And so uh, a, a number of whether it's physical habits or mental habits about about thinking about music aren't established yet. So I'm just kind of I mean, I know this is a bit for a very broad question, but no, it's OK. Yeah. How do you, do you kind of have a what is your philosophy that you've taken and built on from the way you were taught and from your Suzuki training that allows you to be effective from age three to 80? Oh, gosh. Um, flexibility, I think. And, you know, as I, I was watching um, your interviews with my dear colleagues, Zach and Shui. All right. And, um, one thing that Shui said in her interview with you was about 
things being broken down to tiny steps. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you have a three or a four year old in front of you, you know, the very first thing, I, I think this goes for whether you're three or whether you're 80. And actually my oldest student, when she stopped playing was 80. She started at 70. Her husband had given her a cello for her 70th birthday. <laughs> That's just blows my mind, you know, but the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds, these little tiny people, the very first thing they have to establish and also with adults is trust. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she, we mentioned a sense of safety and that's key. And then the other thing is to not throw the entire encyclopedia of your knowledge at them. <laughs> that it takes some judicious restraint on the part of the teacher. First, the connection, you know, I see you. I see you, hi. It's the most important thing. And then that every tiny little victory, every tiny little step has to be celebrated. So I have a game that looks, I made a racetrack and I took my my son's matchbox cars, you know, yeah. I have a box full of them. And the little, the child gets to choose either a little animal or a race car. The boys generally go for the race cars, you know, and the girls generally go for the little animals and we put them on the racetrack and their job is to beat me. So it's like a five, five boxes that say start and then one, two, three, four, five, and a finish line that's decorated. And, you know, their job is to beat me to the finish line. So that builds in, yeah, it's extrin extrinsic motivation to begin with. But every time they move, mommy cheers, teacher cheers, you know, every time they complete a task, that's very, very finite and small, like make three bow holds or do three rocket ships or, um, you know, these very fundamental, that every time you can sit with your cello without it wobbling and while I count to 10 or um, every time, you know, whatever the task is at the very basic level, they get to move a space and that space that is celebrated. And at the end, if they get to the finish line and they take their bow, then they can go to the sticker box and pick out a sticker and put it on their book or their notebook or their chair. Um, I have chairs that are covered in stickers, <laughs> <laughs> little tiny cello chairs covered in stickers. Sure. So, you know, this is, this is how you start the process. And then, of course, we want to move it toward the intrinsic, which is the sound of the cello and the connection, the sort of somatic connection to the instrument that they feel in their bodies. And then that connection to the sound, which I think, you know, for me, it was its own reward. It took a long time to get there for me, but... But once the child connects to the music, because it really, you know, for me, that's what it was. It was the repertoire. It was the, the music, the sound of the instrument, the colors of the instrument. And so we start with the big blocks, you know, like Michelangelo looking at a big block of marble. You, you chip away what isn't needed, but you have to start with the block. So big movements first, big muscles first, and then you move on. And it's a process of refining and refining and refining. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm I also sure. noted from your, uh, the testimonials that, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of things that speak to a teacher who is, who is patient and kind and clear, but, but one of them, one of the things that jumped out at me was somebody commenting on how 
you wove in lots of artistry in everything, even the very uh, kind of rudimentary seeming things. Uh, this per person was pointing out that you'd still bring the the artistry out as much as possible, which I think is a great approach, I'm surely an intentional one, to move Very from much. extrinsic to intrinsic, you know, all along the way. Yeah, well, that is, you know, that's my raison d'etre. That's, that for me is, is why I do what I do. I, because for me, I've heard uh so many fine instrumentalists people who are really good cellists even you know in places like going to the Piatigorsky festival and listening to 10 days worth of master classes and but what's the thing that grabs me is when i hear something that is not just beautiful but is invested and imbued with, you know, you say the word inspiration, it inspire is in, it means connected to spirit. So for me, this is a very deeply, not religious, but spiritual thing to sculpt, to learn how to sculpt the sound and the colors as if the bow were our paintbrush, mm -hmm. the way a, a painter paints a canvas. And I want my students to have those tools. So how to do it, you know, became the quest. So yeah, I bring in, I have art history books. My grandparents were painters. So for me, relating art, architecture, literature, um, painting, sculpture, you know, we often hear artists talk about music having architecture. So I start talking about this as soon as they are shifting. And as soon as they, you know, can control the bow and the speed of the bow. And you know, then I start to talk about once they have the, the rudiments of a bow technique, a bow holder, this or that, I start to talk about speed, placement, weight, where on the bow, where on the string, it's it usually starts uh, middle schoolish, you know, seventh eighth grade, and then then we can explore and expand on that. So yeah, I I I, I introduce it as early as possible, and I try to point them. I'm a little biased about like my favorite cellists, and you know YouTube. Videos. I use them all the time, but I'm pretty picky about who they listen to. <laughs> and, and I'll say, oh, you like that recording? Well, here's, why don't you listen to this one? And I'll, I mean, this is where technology comes in, where now I can, I have a whole list of my vetted performances, <laughs> and I can just pick one out of favorite favorites and text it to them if they're mm -hmm. old. I have a phone if they're not it goes to mom mm -hmm. and I'll say you know why don't you guys sit down and watch this and look at this guy it's harder and harder to get people to go to live performances but I push I try and if failing that we do have a resource with all that is on YouTube these days so I use it shamelessly. <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful resource. Yeah. Free I wish I'd had games. it, you know? <laughs> exactly. I might have oh reached my, my goals a whole lot sooner. If I had. <laughs> All right. I have two more questions for you. One of them yeah, is sure. another thing that really stood out to me was what you have, again, on your website about uh, helping students to prepare for college to think yes. about college, to be kind of mentored into finding finding the best fit and having the right expectations. And so I think this is pretty unique. What what led you to add this offering? 
Well, it, it evolved over time because I saw the sort of mad scramble that, I mean, I had one student really pretty over my career um, in Philly. He's has been now for 10 years, although I think recently left, a professor at the Menuhin School. Mm. Um, he went there as a 13-year-old. And the decision about his direction began when he was about nine or 10 years old because he was extraordinarily gifted. So, you know, that alone, that op at the opportunity, first of all, to have a student like that was pretty mind blowing for a young teacher, but, um, but having watched the trajectory of his career and then having seen some of my, I also had some some parents in my studio at that, in that particular place, Philly being what it was musically, um, to kind of guide students that had like graduated out of the Suzuki method and, you know, had been with me a long time to send them to colleagues in the Philly orchestra, um, and then sort of keeping in touch and saying, well, what schools, you know, and, and sort of being a part of a team with the parent and the new teacher to try to guide them to the right direction. So it began a long time ago, and I've had students in my studio here in Knoxville that um, the ambitious ones that while we have an outstanding standing, wonderful cello professor at the University of Tennessee, my dear colleague, Wesley Baldwin, who you probably have met at some point, yes. just a fantastic guy. But a lot of my students want to go out of state. So learning, keeping up with what's out there, who are the good teachers, especially for kids who out of the Suzuki approach, like my nurturing, careful pedagogy that I don't want to see be, I don't want to see them discouraged. I want them to keep going. And I need to know who are the teachers out there that are going to nurture this talent and or get it to where it needs to be to compete professionally. If it isn't quite there, but they want to pursue music, who are the people who are not going to damage them? Who are the people who are going to help them in their journey, you know, and unless I get, I have a superstar student, you know, and that's happened a couple of times, thankfully, um, who can go into a highly competitive atmosphere and feel like they are ready to handle it. So um, that's what started it. And I was, and then my husband said to me, spending hours on this you know why don't you just like charge for it and offer it <laughs> as part of your practice and then you might be able to help kids from other areas so that's what I did I started um and and it's not just for music majors okay it's also for students that want to continue to play mm -hmm. um so I've got a question for you how you feel about non- as as a teacher at a state university um because a lot of programs don't have um don't have opportunities for non-majors right but or i have kids that want a double major so i need i want to know i want to help them navigate the college application process yeah. and find the right fit that enables them to keep playing. Fortunately, I, I do think that that's on the rise. And by that, I mean acknowledgement that there are, in many cases, many, many very fine place, pay, players, excuse me, and, and very motivated players who just want a different vocation. You know, so uh, things like, in Australia, I think was the first place I heard of doctors' orchestras, That's you know, right. where they, they play at a, a high level and they have no intention at all of giving up their passion for music, but their vocation is is medicine. And 
Um, I mean, it it was now, I think it was more like 15 years ago. I remember talking with uh, Bob Gillespie and, and Paul Robinson at The Ohio State. And, yes. and even back then, they were acknowledging that not everybody that comes through who who plays at, you know, so it was like not trying to make a two-tiered sort of thing. Oh, you're going into some other degree. We're going to treat you differently. Like, hey, if you have the motivation and you're willing to put in the, the work to get your chops here, we'll offer the same resources as to the, the people who are going into the vocation in terms of what ensembles they can play in and, and um, lessons they can take and et cetera, et cetera. So I, I see it as improving over time. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And, you know, let's be realistic about the trajectory now for gaining a position in a major symphony orchestra um, and the cost of a musical education to be at that level. I, I've gone through this with my own son, who was a very, very gifted bass player. And mm -hmm. by the time he was a sophomore in high school, was the principal bass of our youth orchestra was invited to audition at Juilliard and Curtis and New England Conservatory and then um, and Cincinnati, um, where he had already had some lessons with the base professor there. Um, his academic career was not as stellar as his musical career. <laughs> so um, he wound up though at the University of Memphis and he later left came back home, gave up the bass for a time, went back to it, and then went on a big scholarship to New England Conservatory. But the cost of that, um, then he decided to change careers completely. He said, I'm going to come out of here with huge debt, and I'm locked in. I don't want to be an orchestral bassist. It's too confining. He loves improvisation. He plays the guitar. He's a jazzer. He, had, he felt like a fish out of water. He was in the classical track at NEC and then came home and said, this isn't for me after a semester. Had an identity crisis and now is a pilot. <laughs> but you know, having gone through all of that and seen that with so many students, even one who got a gigantic scholarship to North Carolina School of the Arts. She was there for a year, started her sophomore year and decided, I don't want to do this professionally. So she's changing, um, going nursing, which is probably, you know, at first my, I was just like, oh, no. You are one of my best students, but I've learned not to be too attached to outcomes. And I want that. I want my students to be happy. Yeah. I want them to feel like music is part of their lives. Um, yeah, it's great when you get into Juilliard, but then you read the statistics of how many people are still musicians after they finish their degrees and we have to look at the realities of what it takes to win an audition and um, and then not just to win it, but it's one thing to win an audition. It's another thing to hold a position and to deal with the realities of what it is to be in a major symphony orchestra and not everybody is cut out for it, you know? So I, I want to, to set them up so that they can, but they may not want to stay. And I want them to, um, I want them to be able to use their musical backgrounds to gain admission to schools that will be a good fit and where they can keep playing and keep exploring their musical um, interests and and have access to teaching or teachers and guidance without necessarily making the commitment to pursue it as a career. Oh, that's great. So that's how it came about. And it's something that I really feel um, I'm told by other 
colleagues, oh, this is so needed. This is so needed. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just figure people that are interested in having a little extra help. Uh, right now I'm helping a student of mine who's interested in the intersection of music <clears throat> and artificial intelligence. And he's just been deferred at MIT, but he um, has prospects at Carnegie Mellon, which I think would be a great place for him. Um, it's 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 exciting to think that he's already had a seventeen year old who's already had his music picked up by four Japanese gaming companies. So, you know, there are so many ways also to make a career in music yes. that are not necessarily instrumental cello playing or whatever. And yet he wants to keep his cello playing up, which Good. is exciting to me. Yeah, yeah. So, All right, Alicia, what yeah. irons do you have in the fire for 2024? Projects coming up, other upcoming performances? Uh, well, we have a trio performance for the Knoxville Chamber Music Society, which will be a half program in May. Mm -hmm. um, that's exciting. And beyond that, I'm not sure yet. I have some just, you know, general gigs and a, a, a couple of quartet um, things coming up, like just in the community. Um, I have a cello ensemble going out to uh, a couple of assisted living places so mm -hmm. that we can do some community service. Um, I have a workshop. I have a week-long Suzuki Institute in Virginia that I'll be on the faculty of in June. Um, the next few months are a little bit frenetic. Of course, the ASTA and SAA conference in March. So, you know, there's like something every week, every month, I mean, but, um, and some uh, some orchestra concerts. I play with uh, the oldest running, continuously running community orchestra in the country. It's a professional orchestra in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh -huh. And um, it's a professional orchestra, but it's not as demanding as the Knoxville Symphony. All right. Uh, that's in, no, oh, let me think, April. So, you know, there's something every month, but not at quite the frenetic pace that I used to keep. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And our, our trio's in a bit of a transition because our violinist is um, stepping away. Oh. So mm -hmm. we're going to be looking to kind of reconfigure, I think. Mm -hmm. after the May concert. So we'll see what happens. Well, good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, and thanks so much for this. Uh, I mean, just fascinating, really. Oh, thank you. Of You're very kind. <laughs> motivating ideas. Uh, I think everybody's bound to be super excited to, to practice all weekend long, all the following week, until we get back together this time, five o'clock next Friday. We'll see y'all then, everybody. Thanks Thank again, Thank you Alicia. so much. I right. enjoyed it. Get me a cello, cello.